Center for Telecommunication and Technology. Democracy and Technology. Yeah, right. Democracy and Technology. Although it's actually in San Francisco, the uh, center itself is headquartered in D.C. Uh, Jim is a lawyer by trade, uh, but a long time participant in public policy, worked on the Hill, worked for, uh, for the center for a long time, worked for the National Security Archive. Right. Yes. Yes. A proud user of the Computer Information Act. Uh, and really one of the most knowledgeable people on the, uh, in the areas of telecommunication policy, uh, social consequences, freedom, other issues we are all, I think, deeply concerned with, or if not should be. Uh, and it's really a delight. Uh, we uh, were collaborating with Jim last summer on the Compass Project that we ran, which sent uh, doctoral students from about six or eight institutions to D.C. to work in the policy area. And uh, thought it would be really a terrific opportunity to invite him to come and speak to us. Well, thanks. Thanks, Larry. It's great to be here. Um, you were out at, uh, at Palm Springs at the uh, Annenberg House. Um, Walter Annenberg gave his house as well as uh, obviously substantial sums of money to support the two um, uh, uh, communication schools as well as a lot else. And uh, he, his house is now being uh, been converted into a, a convention uh, facility. And so there we were in this amazingly beautiful uh, center uh, with this amazing view out at, at the mountains. And I, I took a picture of it and sent it to my kids and said, well, now I'm really hanging with the 1%. <laughs> uh, this was, I think, the 1% the, the, the of the 1%. Uh, but out of that discussion came, uh, we were talking about what is the relationship between communications studies and policy, and how can um, communication uh, schools and communication students and graduate students uh, become more engaged in and contribute more to uh, the policy process? And of course, uh, both of the Annenberg uh, schools have uh, significant uh, history of engaging in uh, public policy and of uh, professors having sort of a, uh, a foot in both worlds. Uh, certainly you've been um, Ernie Wilson uh, back and forth between government and the academics and someone that I've known uh, for many years. And so uh, I, I offered to come and, and, and speak. And, and the subject uh, which I said I would speak is what do I, as an advocate in uh, the trenches, that is, even though I now live in, in uh, San Francisco, I spent uh, 10 years uh, as a staff counsel on Capitol Hill, uh, working actually for a California congressman, Don Edwards, a wonderful, wonderful uh, lawmaker, now retired. I spent uh, 10 years with CDT in uh, Washington, D.C., and now, since 2005, have been in uh, California with CDT West, but still, half of my brain and uh, a lot of my thought processes are focused on what's happening in, in Washington. And so what I give you is very much that of the, the perspective of someone uh, not approaching these issues uh, academically, not even necessarily approaching them systematically, but looking at the way that policy uh, is presented and developed in Washington and, and how it works in terms of the internet. And you know, when, obviously, when you reflect upon it, for most of you in this room, uh, everybody uh, except four or five people here are, uh, are what are called digital natives, of course, which is you grew up with this technology as sort of part of your uh, personal life, and clearly expect that it will be a part of your digital, uh, part of your, your professional life. Uh, but it, it is remarkable to think about how rapidly and dramatically the internet has grown and how it has become such a powerful platform offering uh, really unprecedented opportunities for access to information and supporting the formation of communities and the exchange of ideas locally, internationally. It has uh, produced various revolutions in commerce, in entertainment, in education. 
It's clearly a powerful tool for democratization. And it has, uh, obviously, potential for bringing efficiencies to health care, to energy management, to a host of other sectors. The question is, how did we get here, and where are we going? And it's my theme today that the internet has not grown by accident, nor is its future insured. In fact, the internet benefits from and has grown enabled by some conscious technical and policy choices. And a number of the current policy debates underway, both in the United States as well as globally, could radically change the nature of the internet and radically affect its future. So it's important for those engaged in internet policy and communications policy in general to understand the technical architectural features that make today's internet uniquely powerful, and to understand how policy can either enforce and promote the uh, nature of the internet, or can hamper it and limit its uh, reach and its power. Let's start with the uh, protocols, the very basic nature of the, uh, of the internet. Bitsurf, one of the fathers of the internet, is fond of saying, talking about IP on everything and everything on IP. IP <coughs> on everything and everything. That's a t-shirt. He worked at a congressional hearing once, so I sat next to that. <coughs> and by that, he means that the brilliance of the internet protocol and the associated standards is that they can operate over any medium all the way from the copper wire of the traditional telephone network, the coaxial cable of the uh, cable network, uh, the airwaves, even power lines. So the internet protocol can be uh, carried, can <coughs> operate on any uh, electromagnetic medium, IP on everything. and Everything can be carried with IP, voice, data, video, uh, all carried over this uh, technology. Now, building on this techno technical insight, the internet, as it has developed, displays some unique uh, attributes. Jonathan Aronson, Aronson and Peter Cowie have explored a lot of these things in their um, writing, including their uh, 2009 book. So what I'm going to say may come, uh, certainly to students at this school, as no surprise, but it's remarkable how uh, unaware sometimes policymakers are, and the general public is, and even people <coughs> in the internet industry who don't fully appreciate the, the policy framework which, within which they, they operate and innovate. So the internet is decentralized. The functionality is pushed to the edges of the network. The internet needs relatively little intelligence at the core of the network to operate. Uh, instead, the innovation occurs at the edges. Innovative applications, uh, devices, appliances can be uh, inserted at the edges of the network and using the internet protocol can communicate over any uh, physical form of medium and can um, interoperate with uh, devices at the other end of the network. And as a result, to a much greater degree than other technologies that came before it, the internet is open. It uh, does not need gatekeepers. In its initial uh, design, it had relatively few gatekeepers, and those gatekeepers had relatively little power. The internet <coughs> is uh, remarkably equal in terms of the way it treats content. Any item of data is equally accessible uh, as any other item of data on the internet, and all points on the network are, are equally accessible. The internet is relatively inexpensive, certainly compared to the uh, cost of a printing press and the cost of a television station or a, uh, a distributing a network for a radio or television. Uh, the internet is relatively inexpensive at the, the basic uh, level. It's abundant. 
the traditional approach to electromagnetic spectrum was that it was scarce, that it had to be regulated because it was uh, limited. And the internet, by contrast, can accommodate an essentially unlimited number of points of entry and an essentially unlimited number of speakers. The internet is relatively borderless. And it's in many ways uniquely user controlled in that the user has um, some unique abilities to select the content that he or she will receive. The parents, uh, school teachers, uh, other caretakers can use filtering software to filter the content. Uh, the whole way that the browser uh, puts the controls in the hands of the <coughs> user compared to other forms of media, uh, media relatively uh, significant. Now, contrary to common misperception, this open, innovative, user-controlled internet did not arise in a policy vacuum. There was never really a wild, wild west of the internet uh, free of legal controls. The fact is, from the very <coughs> beginning, the internet has been enabled by a policy framework that has interface with the technological nature of the medium in some very powerful ways. And the current uh, structure, by and large, emphasizes openness, competition, innovation, user control, freedom of expression. For example, while ISPs themselves have always been relatively unregulated, they benefited from the open the platform of the telecommunications infrastructure which in the United States was always uh, privatized and was based upon the competition enhancing principles of interconnection and non-discrimination. Um, even the fact that in our telecommunications policy before the internet, we had flat rate pricing for local calls. This was a choice made without any reference to the internet at all. But then when people began to hook up dial-up modems, the fact that a local telephone call was a flat rate turned out to be very powerful if you would turn on your modem in the morning and leave it on all day. Very powerful enabling uh, uh, policy. The um, phone companies had fought flat rate pricing. It had been pushed as a consumer uh, protection measure in, in the sort of middle part of the 20th century. Europe, it, it turned out, went to minute meter, uh, per minute metering uh, for telephone calls, even for local calls in Europe. Uh, 30 years ago, used to pay by the minute, that inhibited the growth of the internet in Europe, and then a lot of countries switched to um, flat rate pricing, uh, specifically because they wanted to promote the growth of the internet. But that simply illustrates, the point there is, the relationship between the underlying telecom policy in the early days of the internet and the fact that its technology was able to grow so dramatically. <coughs> Another regulatory uh, action that proved uh, part of the legal underpinning of the internet was a decision by the Federal Communications Commission in 1968, the famous, uh, at least those of us studying internet history, the Carter phone decision. The Carter phone was this very bizarre device that uh, connected two-way mobile radio with the traditional uh, telephone network. And AT&T, which was the dominant uh, monopolist then, uh, and insisted that only AT&T manufactured equipment could be hooked to the telephone network, sought to prohibit Carter Phone from marketing its device on the ground that, oh, it'll crash the network, and it'll be harmful, and people will get shocked by it, and they'll get killed, and all kinds of stuff. And the FCC said, no, AT&T, the standard is not that you get to decide what gets hooked up to your network. You must allow anybody hook up anything to your network so long as it does not affirmatively cause damage to it. It's not that you can say no, you can only uh, prohibit it if it's really damaging and the Carter phone is not damaging. Well, nobody was thinking of the modem, as far as I know, unless anybody knows different. I don't think anybody was thinking of the modem when they issued the Carter phone decision. I think the FCC sort of understood that there was this potential for edge development of technology that could be connected to the telephone network. And then when the modem came along, and people realized, again, two-thirds of the room doesn't even appreciate this, but uh, you know, we used to have to modulate 
the um, digital signal in order to carry it over an analog uh, network. And it was necessary to take the computer bits and turn them into uh, waves in order to transmit the information over an analog network. And that's what the modem did. Well, if AT&T had had its way, they would have said, you can't hook up a modem to our network. We don't make modems, which AT&T's position would have been. And therefore, this whole development of digital communications could have been stopped by the monopolist, but by the monopolist. And this is an example where I say, the bureaucrats got it right. The regulators got it right. The regulators said, no, AT&T, you must allow any device to be connected to your network. And again, that notion that the that innovation would occur. In um, 1996, when Congress was adopting the communications um, reform uh, legislation, that it included uh, the Communications Decency Act, which ended up going in the wrong direction. But at the same time, it adopted the principle that intermediaries, the hosts, of content, the AOLs, the Yahoo's of the time, or the prodigies of the uh, bulletin boards, should not be responsible for the content created by their users. That just as the telephone company is not responsible if somebody is gambling over the internet or defame somebody over the te over the telephone, or if you uh, if you commit a crime over the telephone, the telephone company is not liable. In 1996, it was not actually clear whether this should be extended to the internet or not. And Congress did say, yes, we will extend this principle to the internet. And those who are hosting or transmitting content shall not be responsible for the content they didn't uh, create. And this is known as the protection of intermediaries from liability. Which again, when you think about a uh, YouTube, a Facebook, a uh, MySpace, Craigslist, um, all of those services, all of those platforms are based upon the notion that the owner of the platform is not liable for the content uh, created. The person who created the content is liable. Um, if you're doing something illegal on uh, Facebook or Craigslist, you are still liable. Craigslist is not. That allowed Craigslist, YouTube, I, I forget what the figure is in terms of the number of thousands and thousands of hours of video that are uploaded every day on, on YouTube. Obviously impossible for Google to review all of that before it goes up. And so again, saying that the potential gatekeepers, the owners of the platform, are not liable was a critical decision made by Congress. When Congress did in that, um, in that, um, Telecom Act of uh, 96 try to regulate content on the internet. It was going in two directions at once in that legislation. Um, adopted the Communications Decency Act. Two years later, the Supreme Court uh, struck it down. And uh, CDT had a role that we played in that case. We actually brought some computers into the courtroom in Philadelphia when the case was first heard and gave the judges a tutorial on the internet and how it was different from traditional media and why the internet should not be subject to the same kinds of uh, content restrictions that then apply to broadcast uh, television in which the court and the FCC still have their sort of knickers in a twist over pleading expletives and all that kind of stuff. The Supreme Congress said, uh, and, and Supreme, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court said in 1997 in the ACLU versus Reno case that the internet should be subject to the highest form of free expression uh, protection and uh, should not be subject to the rules traditionally applied to uh, television. And specifically citing the user control nature of the technology and the fact that um, it's not quite like turning a knob on the television. You know, you used to turn knobs on television. Um, Another set of crucial uh, policies revolved around the issue of trust. In uh, the 1980s, relatively early again in the, the life of the internet, uh, Congress adopted the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. At that time, uh, 
email was just beginning to come into use, data communications were just beginning to come into use as a commercial application, um, cell phones were just beginning to come into use. The government, the Justice Department, was taking the position that email should not be protected like telephone calls, and that the email in transit was not entitled to a protection of uh, privacy, and the government could intercept it, said the, said the Justice Department, without a court order. Congress adopted the same rule for the email in transit as applies to the telephone call, and said that, no, you need a warrant from a judge. Congress said the same thing for the cell phone call passing over. Uh, the airways. The Justice Department was basically arguing um, if you use the cell phone, you have no right of privacy or expectation of privacy. So again, you see Congress with um, the uh, Electronic Communications uh, Privacy Act. You see the FCC with the Carter phone decision and sort of its approach to uh, the computer uh, technology and the judiciary in the Reno versus ACLU case, you see, in a way, each branch of government, the dreaded government, um, getting it right in terms of policies that would promote innovation, um, encourage the build out of uh, new services. At the same time, there were those who recognized when it was important not to regulate. And one of the critical decisions in terms of thinking about the enabling framework for the internet is when do you regulate and when do you not regulate? So, you know, the internet to some extent uh, was born under the auspices <coughs> of the Pentagon and uh, Vince Cerf and Dave Clark and Bob Kahn and some of the other true fathers of the internet who developed this technology were many of them working under government contract and yet, the, the, the DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, that funded a lot of their work, and then the National Science Foundation, which funded a lot of that work, did not try to dictate the technology. Did not say, you have to use this protocol, or this standard, or it has to look like this, or it has to work like that. And instead, consciously decided that government would not try to dictate the technology. And today we have um, still the internet uh, technology, the protocols governed and um, uh, developed and fleshed out by voluntary standards bodies, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium, other non-governmental, multi-stakeholder, global, uh, participatory, uh, certainly in the case of the IETF, very open. Basically, if you show up and you know what you're talking about, you can have an impact on the development of, of a standard. In the 1990s, this played out a bit in the debate over encryption policy. And the government, throughout the 20th century, had control uh, encryption technology. And it basically deemed uh, the mathematical formulas associated with encryption to be a weapon, to be a dual use technology that had military as well as civilian applications and therefore couldn't be exported and uh, in, in, if it was strong, if it was effective, couldn't be exported. This ended up depressing the overall market in uh, encryption generally, leaving communications vulnerable and industry and civil liberties advocates worked together with some of the world's leading cryptographers and ultimately convinced the administration to abandon the most of the controls on encryption uh, technology, that this, the government would not try to regulate this technology. Uh, they now regulate sort of the highest of the levels, but uh, so the, the HTTPS that uh, obviously is now uh, the default on Google. Every time, obviously, you buy a plane ticket or a book or anything online, uh, that, that sort of HTTPS the government had tried originally to say, no, we want that to be weak. We want that to be uh, regulated. And instead, in the 90s, the policy decision was made not to regulate that, precisely because it was better for security in the long run, including better for government security, better for banking security, uh, to have strong encryption rather than weak 
encryption that the government would break in the name of um, in the name of security. So you see this sort of patchwork of regulation, self-regulation, or multi-stakeholder policy development, uh, such as you see around um, the internet standards bodies, the uh, ICANN, the Inter Internet Domain Names Organization over here in uh, Marina Del Rey, um, and um, non-regulation, just a decision by the government to, um, to not intervene. To try to make sense of that, and the way that I think it makes sense, is there are some underlying themes or values or principles that we believe uh, define a successful policy framework for the internet. User control, um, protecting intermediaries from liability, free expression, that sort of set of issues around content and saying the government will not intervene and regulate content. Instead, users will choose, intermediaries will be protected, free expression will be strongly protected. Innovation, as opposed to government technology mandates. A trust, both in terms of the security side as well as the privacy of communication. And then the dual values of uh, openness and non-discrimination in terms of the treatment of content passing over the uh, network. So looking now at some of the current <coughs> policy debates, how do they measure up against uh, these values? And any given policy proposal, I think, can be looked at, among other ways, looked at through these um, principles. Will the proposal increase or diminish user control? Will it promote or stifle innovation? Will it enhance or undermine trust? Will it keep the network open and foster competition and uh, innovation at the edges? Or will it impose a gatekeepers and require people to get permission to um, transmit their content or to innovate at the edges? Now, members of Congress, again, seem to forget even what they themselves created. And one of the most remarkable examples of that recently, of course, was the debate over SOPA and uh, PIPA, uh, the anti-piracy legislation aimed, in our view, at an absolutely legitimate concern, that is uh, websites, particularly off offshore websites, uh, largely devoted to uh, trafficking in copyrighted material. Um, as a solution, though, the policymakers decided that they would enlist the gatekeepers in the enforcement mechanism. So while the internet has fewer gatekeepers and the gatekeepers are less powerful than they are in, let's say, the traditional media, uh, compared certainly to television, um, certainly compared to cable, uh, the internet does have gatekeepers. Um, it has the ISPs themselves. It also has the search engines, which obviously play a critical navigational role. And if it can't be found by the search engine, it's almost as good as not existing, almost. Um, and the domain name system, the one truly, truly centralized function in the internet is the domain name system. Every domain name has to resolve to only one IP address. And there has to be just one entity in a relatively hierarchical structure that keeps track of names and numbers and that allocates the blocks of numbers and allocates or at least oversees the process for associating the names with the numbers. If you can get to the domain name system and if you can say cdt.org will not actually translate into the IP number address for CDT, then you've killed CDT. Because everybody who types in uh, our domain name will not be able to find us. So that's the centralized choke point. And that's, in a way, what Congress said, that uh, uh, the Attorney General could designate certain websites and issue an order directing the domain name system, these relatively few companies in this sort of 
strictly pyramidical hierarchical system that uh, keeps track of which domain name is associated with which, which number, would have to basically poison, in a way, poison their database and say, even though we know that this domain name and this number go together, when we see this number, we're going to tell people don't go to this domain name. Now, one of the interesting things was, when we really looked at this policy, what's wrong with this policy? First of all, it's enlisting the gatekeepers in the process of policy enforcement, and enforcing the gatekeepers who, sh who should serve a relatively limited role of getting bits from point A to point B, enlisting them in enforcement. Secondly, it turned out that it was inserting a, a security flaw into the internet. Because if you can get the domain name system to take a, a, a name and turn it into a different number, so then when you type in bankofamerica.com and it actually doesn't go and the system has now taught itself, not every time you type in Bank of America <coughs> will it go to just this one address, but we will let the government and others come in and introduce new commands into the system, redirecting traffic away from where it's going. Suddenly you've now inserted a security flaw into the system. And you saw, obviously, and I assume some of you participated, and uh, on January 18th, uh, we're one of the 4 million people signing petitions or uh, calling Congress and seeing the, the blackouts on uh, Wikipedia and uh, Craigslist and the little bar on uh, Google, et cetera, protesting this. And Congress withdrew that legislation, but it was very, very close to passing, um, ignoring this principle that um, the, uh, you should not try to insert this gatekeeping function into it. Because, of course, China was right there saying, okay, yeah, we like this policy. <laughs> Sign us up for that. Um, innovation is another value that remains at stake in uh, current policy debates. Um, you see it to be in a lot of the law enforcement and cyber security issues. Now, you know, on the law enforcement side, you look at this technology and you just have to say, this is the golden age of government surveillance. I mean, there is more information about us out there on the network in digital form and more readily available to the government than ever before. And yet, um, the government's not satisfied with that. They want to actually force the developers of the technology to build it in a more wiretap friendly way and to keep even more information about it. So all of this information that we're storing in the cloud all of this information that's being um, generated in the course of our daily lives uh, with all of this technology. The government wants service providers to keep even more of that so that it'll be available should the government want it in a criminal investigation. Uh, and again, dictating technology that the companies already keep, but obviously a ton of information for their own purposes. Layering on, we wrote a memo uh, which we issued at the beginning of this year explaining just how complicated the uh, assignment of IP addresses now is with um, uh, the limited number of IPv4 addresses that exist and the way that even at the carrier level, um, service providers are sharing addresses among multiple users. And the technology mandate at that point becomes very, very uh, impractical. But again, policymakers think that they should be able to control this technology. Trust is at uh, risk as well online, of course, both in terms of uh, government surveillance as well as in terms of consumer privacy. Um, I mentioned ECPA as one of the, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986 <coughs> as one of the cornerstones of the trust framework for the internet that said that your email passing over the wire is as equally protected as your telephone, text, voice, data, uh, HTTP, uh, whatever it is, is equally protected over the wire. In 1986, the drafters of ECPA did not fully appreciate the move to storage. So they did equate the email to the postal letter, which moves, of course, from hand to hand, is not copied as it moves. But they were thinking of the telephone call, which is ephemeral and moves through the network. They did not fully appreciate 
what we now see is the storage revolution or the evolution of the cloud and the fact that communications increasingly would be stored. <coughs> and now, of course, um, we all have years and years worth of email stored free in the cloud at Google services, um, Google Docs, Dropbox, um, any number of cloud-based services where Fourth Amendment protects our persons, houses, papers, and effects. Um, our effects pretty clearly include our laptop, our, our mobile device. So whatever I have stored on here, whatever I have in my laptop, fully protected by the Fourth Amendment. But this, what I have here is also copied in possibly multiple places on the, the network. Very convenient, accessible at any time, backed up, probably more secure there than it is in my personal device. But, says the government, available without a court order, available with a subpoena. Subpoena is a Latin for no judge has ever approved this. <laughs> issued by a prosecutor or an FBI agent uh, who can issue them. Basically, a subpoena is a piece of paper saying, give me everything. Um, and now it can be served. It's one thing when the subpoena is served on you, and then you can fight it, you can resist it, you can go in and say it's overbroad or it's burdensome or uh, it's unjustified, very, very low standard, but still you have that a little bit of opportunity to fight back. When the subpoena is served on Google or on Dropbox or on any other cloud service provider, you're not even told. Twitter, you saw the recent stories in which Twitter tries to inform its users when even this, the subscriber identifying information that they have is subpoenaed. Um, Google takes the position that a warrant is required. They will fight back um, and demand a warrant for stored content, email, calendar, docs, whatever. Um, but other service providers, um, I think the government may be getting the state of the certainly they claim it is. We've put together a, a coalition to argue for updating the law. The courts, the courts have uh, been very slow, although they are beginning to catch up. So you saw the Supreme Court decision of, uh, again, January, I guess it was January 23rd or 24th of this year, the Supreme Court ruled that a warrant is required for GPS tracking. Now that was a case where the government had planted a device on the bottom of the guy's car, tracked him for 30 days. The Supreme Court said this violates the reasonable expectation of privacy. It would normally require a warrant. Then the question is, as I say, every person in this room has a tracking device with them right now, which is your mobile phone, which every seven or eight seconds is reporting to the network saying, here I am. And even though my GPS may not work inside this building, certainly won't work out in the hallway out there, my cell phone will. So in some ways, the cell phone data is even more revealing and clearly identifies you in, in private spaces even more than the GPS does. That'll be the next uh, battle. Uh, so the debate over internet neutrality is another um, issue here. Uh, I had mentioned the telephone regulatory structure based upon interconnection and non-discrimination. The telephone company uh, cannot discriminate against one user over another. It cannot process one person's calls more effectively than another person's calls. Um, cable is not subject to those common carriage rules. Cable um, is not subject to the kinds of non-discrimination rules uh, or was not that the telephone company was. So in order to preserve that non-discrimination principle, the FCC um, adopted its internet neutrality rules, which are now being challenged in uh, the courts. But again, an effort to shape the policy to promote openness, decentralization, competition, non-discrimination, trust, these sort of values. Now these four or five uh, principles, uh, user control, trust, innovation, openness, uh, non-discrimination, they're not exclusive, they're not dispositive. Uh, obviously there are counter uh, failing considerations. Uh, terrorism is a genuine issue. Cybersecurity is a real problem that the uh, market hasn't fully solved. Intellectual property is a cornerstone 
of the, the U.S. economic system, clearly. Um, copyright laws are in part, in fact, intended to promote innovation. Um, so uh, the content industry clearly has a compelling case that they make about um, the need to, uh, their, their need to protect their property and the overall societal benefit of that. Moreover, the values of openness and innovation and freedom do not, as I mentioned before, do not dictate a regulatory or non-regulatory approach. But they do help us decide what to regulate and how and what not to regulate. So the challenge we face going forward is to preserve, develop, expand, reform the policy framework surrounding the internet in a way that addresses the societal needs, crime, child online protection, intellectual property protection, while at the same time promoting innovation uh, and the other values that have fostered the growth of this uh, amazing medium. So in the coming years, I hope that you will all be engaged one way or another in uh, this debate. And um, I hope that I've given you some framework for looking at the kinds of issues that you read about and trying to determine when is regulation appropriate, what it should it be, how should policy be formed, what is the right mix of government, uh, the sort of private multi-stakeholder organizations, strict user control or user choice. So with that, we still have some time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that the U.S. won in that one. I think the outcome was more complicated. Um, certainly, Yahoo, in the case with France over Nazi memorabilia, Yahoo was actually uh, required to um, not deliver um, Nazi content returns to uh, people who seem to be coming in. First, first of all, Yahoo France and Google France. Uh, so Google.fr and Yahoo.fr do not um, host Nazi uh, memorabilia. So, um, and then in terms of returning results, I thought the outcome was that um, uh, uh, companies involved did voluntarily, quote unquote, voluntarily adopt some kind of filtering that prevented the return. Now, what the return of results? to what appeared to be users coming from out of France. So the case presented this incredible, incredibly complex set of questions about jurisdiction over the internet globally. So literally around the world, the exact same issues that we talk about today are being debated. Cybercrime, data retention, <coughs> intellectual property protection, content controls, protection of children, intermediary liability, uh, government surveillance, uh, government surveillance mandates. Pretty much every country in the world, maybe with the exception of North Korea, is considering and debating these issues today. Um, and there is an overarching sort of human rights framework that, again, most countries of the world have subscribed to. Um, U.S. and Europe are actually relatively close together in their policy approaches, in my view. I see the big counter model as the China counter model. So if you look at the policy framework that I described, free expression, openness, user control, competition, innovation, 
more or less, more or less, Europe and the US are sort of here on the spectrum. China's over here. So China's clearly saying we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have all the economic benefits of the technology and none of the, um, none of the um, de democratic implications of it. So huge, huge investment in controlling uh, what people see and read and both technical as well as human resources trying to control the web. And trying to export that model to the rest of the world. Um, so China and Russia have teamed up now on a proposal that would give the ITU greater, the International Telecommunications Union, which is a UN treaty-based body, greater uh, regulatory authority over the internet. Currently, the ITU regulates spectrum, it regulates telephone numbers, it regulates uh, some of the basic telephone uh, technology, but it does not regulate uh, internet by and large. Uh, China and Russia are pushing, in a way, playing off of the argument that the rest of the world, and particularly less developed countries and the sort of South, have been kept out of policy development by US domination. But it's, you see who's leading it. It's China and uh, Russia. Uh, now, you know, US and Europe, again, France, does have free expression, slightly different, certainly <coughs> different approach to, um, you know, um, neo-Nazi, Nazi, xenophobic hate speech uh, than the U.S. has. But, you know, we had a case coming up out of uh, Italy involving uh, Google, the precursor to YouTube, and a video there. Um, but again, I see Euro Europe and the U.S. as much more closely aligned on internet policy, certainly when you contrast it with China and where China's come from. So with the Italian case, it did seem that the Italian courts felt that YouTube or Google owning YouTube had a certain moral responsibility according to the Italian norms that we wouldn't see in the United States. Um, the, the details of the case were that um, a video of an autistic child was uploaded to YouTube, and it was decided by <coughs> that YouTube had a responsibility to prevent that video from ever being uploaded in the first place. But in the U.S., it almost certainly would have gone the other way, that as long as they took it down, according to take down those, right. they would have been all right. Right. And actually, even that case ended up getting more complicated than it started out there. So again, Europe and the US actually both have the same rule, which is that a host is not liable <coughs> for the content that they um, host. The creator of the content is liable, not the host. Until the host receives a notice, if it's illegal, then they have to take it down. So they cannot knowingly host illegal content. U.S. is a little more generous to hosts, but um, roughly the principle is the same in Europe and the U.S. actually, which is why I see sort of a congruence between our, our frameworks. <laughs> to complicate things in Europe, there's a data protection or privacy um, directive. And in a very, very, very confusing clause, the privacy directive says that it doesn't apply to um, or it's not subject to the rules of the e-commerce directive, which protects the intermediaries. So the court in that case ultimately actually ruled that the only liability of Google was that they had failed to notify their users that they were bound by, that the users were bound by the privacy rules. So that case was sort of a big hoopla and a lot of comment about it in the Google executives face criminal charges, blah, blah, blah. Um, it ended up being less significant uh, and less dramatic in the final, final outcome of it. Um, although Italy continues to try to sort of go its own way. Um, although in that case was under Berlusconi, who was obviously more wanting to control the alternative media because um, he saw that. Yeah, I think it's a but now, now it's, with Berlusconi out of the question, it's actually interesting to see what Italy will do um, in terms of its approach to the internet. 
Um, on the question of sort of how uh, communication scholarship could influence these debates, I mean, as you know, many of the debates are dominated by economists who talk about you know sort of the market consequences of doing this or that, or lawyers who argue about whatever the law does or doesn't say or was intended to say. How do you see communication scholarship entering, and what sort of yeah. you know contribution would it make separate from yeah, this sort of law? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's very important to ask how are people actually using the technology? Um, something as simple as privacy controls or something as simple as how people create their social networks and how they view and treat and react to their social networks. Uh, uh, I think, you know, on the more technological side, huge work to be done and being done on security issues and so on. But I think really, how are people using the technology? What cues do they respond to? What are the most effective mechanisms? So if you're, if you're trying to protect children online, either from um, sexually explicit content or from predatory conduct, um, sort of really understanding, Dana Boyd has done a lot of the work on this. How do children, young people, really use the technology? I mean, the funny thing was, um, there was a member of Congress who was, uh, they used to have house pages, which were high school kids who worked for Congress delivering messages. I think they've actually eliminated the program. As an ancient, it was a 100 year long program. A member of Congress was hitting on the kids. Um, and sending them texts. All of the pages said, this guy's a creep, stay away from him. Um, and every, all the, the first thing you know you heard, when you, one of the first things you heard from your page was this member of Congress, just like weird. But don't respond to his text and don't go near him. The adults were all like in a dither about what to do about this and um, how to respond. And it was an example where here the policy members of Congress didn't quite fully appreciate the fact that the high school pages were more sophisticated <laughs> about what was going on and saw it for what it was and weren't taken in by this, this member of Congress. So, so you rightly put a lot of emphasis on user control, as, as you told us. And in, in your answer to Larry, you said what we can bring also is a better understanding of usage on the internet. One of the complicating factors, though, is that it's increasingly difficult to know who's a user and who's a provider. It used to be with a phone company you knew ATT was providing and everybody else was using. Now, you know, 12 years ago when Google gets started, the two guys who started were users and progressively they become providers. And everybody's in this kind of gray zone of right. using the internet to provide something for somebody else. Right. So how do we think about this? Well, I mean, that's an interesting subject for study in and of itself, right? Because tonight, I mean, uh, Jonathan Zittrain, more of a legal perspective, but talks about the generative net and what is it that makes a user become a creator of content or an application and, you know, the whole revolution of big data and the possibility for people to take data and analyze it and find meaning in it that the collector of the data didn't even anticipate and the way that people use technology and build more apps and mash up data in ways that the creator of the technology didn't even anticipate. I think from my perspective, it's sort of what is it that allows that to happen? And where when are there policies that either promote that or discourage that. So open source versus proprietary source and how do people interact with those and what are the impacts of, uh, you know, and, you know, to Microsoft's credit, Microsoft's argues, look, yeah, we're proprietary, but there are 100,000 authorized developers, if not 500,000, all of whom, you know, this closed software is, can be just as much a platform for innovation, maybe as open source, free and open software. But I think from my perspective, the question is, what is it that
that allows people so that everybody, because we, back in the early days of the internet, we said, what's great about this? Everybody can be a speaker. Now what's great about it? Everybody can be an innovator. Everybody can be an entrepreneur, which is the app-based model. And so the browser, the laptop, the mobile device, the social network all become platforms into which anybody can insert an application. And where that's going to go is not fully predictable. But from my perspective, I, I say that's a good set of developments. And so then the question becomes, what makes them happen? So Pepper, you commented that the, the problem was the means as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to some of the values, do you see an, a, a realignment of incentive on a different uh, bill that would pursue the same ends as something PIPA? So telecom and new media organizations would collaborate on this. Yeah, as of now, um, we've talked about that a lot at CDT, and we would like to play a role. We very much believe in sort of finding common ground and saying, OK, here's a problem. How can we solve it in a way that maximizes the different values at stake? Um, and we would like to be able to play that role. So far, um, both the emotions are, so, are still raw over the Sofa Pippa fight, as well as there's a certain amount of the content industry saying Sofa Pippa was just Google and Google's money, which I just think is flatly wrong. But so long as content believes that we lost because Google put its money into the game here, um, so long as that's the attitude of content, then they're not in a compromising mood. They're just going to raise more money to try to outspend Google next time. Or take another you know, route, go through the states, or something like that. Try to do a treaty or whatever. So they will continue. I, for now, it looks like dialogue is not timely, unfortunately. Okay, we're out of time. Okay. <laughs> uh, next week, we have Pat Thomas speaking about